Okay guys, welcome back to your IGTV here on Moan Inc. If you guys are on YouTube, then what is up? Welcome back. And if you're on IGTV, then wow, because more people tune in on YouTube. So I'm very impressed that you're here on Instagram. So thank you so much for tuning in. Let's start there because I really, really appreciate it. And I know that because it's Saturday, this is always the odd day. People are like, Ugh, do I really have to watch something that's educational? And the fact that you're here, I massively appreciate it. So for your Saturday episode though, following on from yesterday, Zeno, we are going to be discussing the very, very famous pre-Socratic, who is Pythagoras. So Pythagoras was born in like 570-ish BC and he died somewhere around 500 BC. Somewhere around, that's kind of the key phrase and I always say this, I've said this in every single episode and I will say this in every episode to follow. Take those with a grain of salt, okay? Because if you do about 10 years on either side of either of those dates, you're probably right. I just round them up to kind of those dates. You can go onto any website and they'll say five years either side, 10 years either side, somewhere around that. These are just the dates that most commonly pop up, okay? So those are the dates that he was supposedly around, supposedly born, supposedly died, okay? Now I wanna start this video actually by saying sort of like the take home message, I guess, from this entire episode. And that is that actually, we have no writing from Pythagoras himself. Nada, none, we have absolutely nothing from him, which obviously makes things a little bit difficult and we need to use other sources in order to find out what the f Pythagoras was on about. However, the name Pythagoras probably isn't unfamiliar to you guys, unlike a lot of these pre-Socratics, that Pythagoras is probably one of the most in fact, probably the most popular name that you've heard, because if you've done maths at any sort of entry level in regards to whatever it is, I'm, I, I was about to say geometry, but I'm not even sure if it's geometry. I'm shit at maths. But he did that whole right angle triangle thing, right? So uh, you probably know him because of that. So that's sort of what he's really famous for, but we have no writing from him actually. I'll be getting into that in a hot second because the reasoning behind that is a little bit interesting. So very little is actually known about Pythagoras himself. Very, very, very little is known about him. And actually what we do know is that he founded a cult club, well, I don't know, type thing, fraternity, whatever it is you want to call it. He founded some weird sort of cult on this, uh, this area. This is where he found it. It's just easier to show you guys a map. So this is where the cult was. People went from far and wide to end up studying there. This was like a big thing and supposedly he founded it. Now, many people, many contemporary people, many people writing today will claim that this cult, or not even just today, but also like in ancient times, lots of people will claim that this, I'm calling it a cult. It was more like a club, but it just shows you how I view it. That many people claimed that this club, this frat, let's say, that they were actually super orphic. And what that means is, and it's literally like, like that's the word that they use. And what that means is that they carried a lot of beliefs, whether religious or philosophical, that link back to the uh, poet Orpheus. It is oftentimes compared, and a lot of Pythagorean doctrines and Orphic doctrines, they are contrasted and compared constantly. However, there's no substantial evidence for this, and that's just, super important thing to point out that it's just more hearsay rather than here's the actual evidence for why it's Orphic and here's the actual evidence for why it's not. There's no evidence really for it being Orphic and for them actually getting a lot of influence from Orpheus himself. So so just bear that in mind when you do pop up onto any sort of, <laughs> sort of website that talk about Pythagoras, uh, just bear that in mind. Now we don't know a lot about Pythagoras like I just said, and not only do we not know a lot about Pythagoras, we also know f all about his followers. And that's really interesting because supposedly, supposedly, this shit was like Fight Club, okay? And I say it was like Fight Club. I, I have compared a lot of things in the ancient world to Fight Club because that's the easiest way to make it understandable. But apparently, apparently, if you were a follower of Pythagoras, you could not tell anyone what you guys discussed. And you could not tell people that you were part of this weird cult, club, fraternity, whatever it is you want call it. Apparently you couldn't share that information and it was because you couldn't compare it with, compare it. It's because you couldn't share it even. You could not relay it to people who were not initiated into the cult club fraternity. What is wrong with me today? But you couldn't tell people uh, that you were part of this, this club. It was like completely closed. You couldn't tell people if 
you were part of it, you couldn't tell people what you discussed. And that leads me on to the next point actually, which is really, really weird, is that all of the writing, all of the theories that this club came up with had to be attributed to Pythagoras. That was like kind of in the fine print when you joined the fraternity, when you joined the club, that it was like, hey, if you come up with a theory, it doesn't matter if you came up with it. If you're part of the school, Pythagoras now came up with it. So we don't know who his followers were. We don't know any of this because they all, if they came up with a theory, if they came up with an idea, they would put his name on it. They would slap his name on it and be like, Pythagoras thought of this. So we, yeah, it's just really weird that none of them were seen as individual people even enough that their theories were attributed to them. Everything was to Pythagoras. They were simply just like extensions of Pythagoras in different periods, which is bizarre. Because of this though, it means that we cannot divide up separate Pythagorean theories to people, but we can do it via sort of time periods. So we can do this in three different time periods. We have sort of period one to two, which is from like the founder of the cult through to Parmenides, and then sort of the last the third sort of segment, third sort of generation, is the generation that were taught by them kind of after they died. And then they sort of kept coming up with theories that were in, like in line with what Pythagorean, Pythagorean theories are. So that's sort of the three different <laughs> sort of clubs, I guess, sort of generations of this weird frat. Uh, but yeah, we cannot distribute different ideas to different people who are part of it it's all distributed to Pythagoras just in different time frames. Now, because we have nothing exactly of Pythagoras himself, we have to, like I said, we've got to trust a lot of other sources. And so people like Herodotus, uh, they've kind of said, and, and Xenophanes actually, they've kind of said that Pythagoras, he brought a lot of his theories from Egypt. He supposedly at some point went to Egypt, studied there, and he brought back a lot of his theories from Egypt and just kind of put them into this cult and then labeled them as Greek. But that's all just kind of legend and just hearsay. Once again, we have no actual evidence for that. That's just what a bunch of people from, who are reflecting on this time, who have said, yeah, he actually wasn't like the shit like everybody thinks he was. He just stole the shit from the Egyptians. But once again, that's just kind of hearsay regards to him. But what we do know is that in regards to his theories, he has kind of an unclear theory of cosmology. Now, the reason why I'm starting there when it comes to his theories is because that's primarily what we've been discussing apart from yesterday with Zeno, where I was like, okay, we just really need to discuss his paradoxes. With Pythagoras though, his theory of cosmology is bizarre and a little bit unclear. Uh, at least for me, if it's very, very clear for you guys, then do leave a comment, but I'm gonna explain it and I'm gonna tell you why I think it's quite unclear. So he claims, Pythagoras claims, that the universe is like a single mass. The world, the universe, it's one big mass and there are sort of impurities all over it. And souls sort of have to like make up for the fact that there are impurities, which is why there's reincarnation. And he, he, there are all these stories about him like walking down the street and seeing like a dog and being like, oh, that's my friend. I totally recognize it from the bark. Like, he would always say things like that and he really believed in reincarnation and he believed that this whole soul moving from body to body that that would happen over and over and over again until that soul had paid off for the impurities in the world and so then once it was you know it had paid for all the impurities and it had you know metamorphosized like how many times who knows he doesn't give you that number but he says it does it a bunch of times once it regains back its purity and it makes up for all the little impurities in the world then it's like reabsorbed into the universe and it can then you know do its do its little thing in the universe and now being part and sort of like be uh, laid to rest essentially but that's that's like his idea on cosmology is that it's sort of like this whole endless cycle in this single mass and everything has to make up for something else and in re it's very much in regards to purity and impurities and all that kind of stuff and that is really f weird because we haven't had that put forward before it's a much more religious concept of cosmology it's a much more like you must do what i kind of tell you to do and you must do x y and z and like you have to be good and not sin and pure this all sounds like a lot of christian imagery and that's kind of what pythagoras is putting forward in his cosmology which is weird but he didn't actually write that down we don't actually have that with like him signing it at the bottom so that is still all hearsay and it's like i've read it like what maybe 10 times now and i'm still like what is he talking about this is ridiculous i think it's weird but i know that you guys are really here if you guys clicked on pythagoras you're like what about the math stuff so we'll talk about the math stuff and his math stuff is actually where it gets really really interesting so his math stuff he basically believed that everything in the universe 
everything in the world, the universe, it can be numerically explained and numerically reasoned. Herodotus and Heraclitus suggest that he believed that the universe was split into two, which is what sort of balances his ideas of cosmology and then his idea of science and math. So those are the two sort of realms of the universe, let's say. And so in regards to the science stuff, that yes, we had all the impurities going on, but then yes, everything can be numerically explained. And then within this sector, there are like two separate important things that he discusses, two sort of like subcategories. So the first subcategory is about uh, unlimited and limited things and like the dualism between those things. So that's one sector. And then the second sector is about the equation between like things and numbers. So those are the two things we're really gonna focus on the limited and unlimited stuff because this episode is gonna be really, really long if I start going into everything. So limited and unlimited, what you need to know is that limited is good, it's seen as everything that is good, and unlimited is seen as everything that is bad. So limited though are odd numbers, and unlimited are even numbers. That's just something that is is like a base level, the reasoning behind that is, is a little bit weird because he I mean I, I think it's weird because I don't really get maths, I just want to clarify that. It's not actually that weird, like it does make logical mathematical sense. I mean, supposedly, I, I don't think it does. But according to Aristotle, he would portray numbers as images. So here's like the famous one of like, you know, the 10, he would count 10 is an equilateral triangle. And then these two, which depict even numbers and odd numbers. So these two images are really important because they show you the limited and unlimited uh, of the numbers. So the reason why odd numbers are limited, if we look at this image, the reason why odd numbers are limited is because you cannot half them, right? So you can't half, as we look at three, right? So you got one, one, two, three, and then whatever, going up and up and up. You can't half that. You can't half it nicely. There's gonna be a decimal point. So there's a limited numbers. And that's why things that are limited are good. So things that are good are attached to odd numbers. And in contrast to that, we have unlimited numbers. Unlimited numbers are even numbers because if we look at this image, when you can half, you know, two, you can half four, you can half all these things. So they are infinite. They are unlimited numbers. And he says that everything that is opposite to good and all of those sort of things, those, <laughs> those are unlimited. So that's how they coexist. So that's how not only do the numbers relate to different things, but then that's how those things thus relate to the rest of the universe. So good, bad, those things relate to the universe. Everything can be boiled down to numerical reasoning. And that was sort of like his, you know, idea of arithmetic and all that kind of stuff. But the universe actually not that complicated, not that verbal, must be much more mathematical. Now, not only do these numbers make the universe, but they also make the substance that form the universe. And they are also units that form spatial magnitude. And that is how he really, really relates them. That you're probably like, well, numbers and good, that's kind of weird. But it's this attachment in the middle, the middle step is about magnitude. Now, we discussed magnitude, right? We discussed it yesterday. If you haven't checked out yesterday's episode, you should, because I discussed how this cup has magnitude, and therefore it can't be... In fact, you know what? I'm not going to get into it. But we discussed it yesterday in regards to this cup that is still sitting on the table today. And so basically Pythagoras says that anything in the universe that has magnitude must have mathematical reasoning and therefore can be boiled down to mathematical reasoning and then built up to mathematical reasoning, which everything in the universe has magnitude, everything. So that's sort of where the base of numbers sort of is held as like the middle step between numbers, theories, magnitude. And thus the two are forever interconnected. That is Pythagoras. I hope I did a really good job in summarizing that, I really hope. Because it's after that, which I won't get into this episode, but it's after that that he claims you've got this relating to his idea of the void, you've got it relating to his idea of the soul, you've got it relating to shapes, astronomy, whatever it is you happen to be, it all comes from this whole basic idea. So if you wanna know any more of those ideas and how Pythagoras reasons them, then leave a comment. We'll, we could make a follow-up video if you want to, or we can just reply in the comments. Holla at us, let us know. But I hope I made that super duper simple. And the most important thing to remember about Pythagoras, not only is that we have absolutely zero writing from him and he made a weird cult, the other important thing that I would say is that everything to him in the universe boils down to uh, numerical reasoning, to arithmetic, and that's sort of where everything is based. So thank you guys so much for tuning in. I know this episode was a little bit longer. There was a little bit more to say about Pythagoras and I did try my best to summarize as much as possible. So if it's unclear, like I said, holler at me in the comments. If not, on your way down, just hit the like button so that I know you guys are very in tune with this episode and you guys are in tune with this series. So we'll be seeing you tomorrow with more. Can you believe it? We have more pre-Socratics who we're gonna be getting through. So tomorrow we'll be seeing you uh, right here in the same place, same time. See you then.